I have to say that I'm very glad to be here. I understand we have over 80 countries here, so that's a, a whole new paradigm for me to speak to all of these countries. In each country, I'm sure you have this thing called the parent-teacher conference. Do you know about the parent-teacher conference?、Uh, not the ones for your kids, but the one you had as a child, where your parents come to school and your teacher talks to your parents, and it's a little bit awkward. <laughs> well, I remember in third grade,、um, I had this moment where my my father. Who never takes off from work. He's a classical, blue-collar,、uh, a working-class immigrant person going to school to see his son how he's doing. And the teacher said to him, "He said, 'You know, John is good at math and art.'" And he kind of nodded. You know. The next day, I saw him talking to a customer at our tofu store, and he said, "You know, John's good at math." <laughs> and that always stuck with me all my life. Why did Dad say art? Why was it not okay?、Uh, Why、uh, became a question in my entire life, and、um, uh, that's all right because、uh, being good at math meant he bought me a computer. And、um, some of you remember the, this computer. This is my first computer. Who had an Apple II? Apple II users, very cool. I just remember the Apple II did nothing at all. <laughs> you'd plug it in, you'd type it, and green text would come out. It would say you're wrong most of the time. That was a computer we knew.、And、that computer is a computer that、uh, I learned about、uh, going to MIT. My father's dream. Uh, and MIT, however, I learned about the computer at all levels. And after I went to art school to get away from computers, and I began to think about the computer as more of a spiritual space of thinking. And、uh, I was influenced by performance art. So this is uh, uh, 20 years ago.、Um, I made a computer out of people. It was called the Human Powered Computer Experiment. I have a, a power manager, mouse driver, memory, etc. And、um, I built this in Kyoto. Uh, the old capital of Japan. It's a room broken in two halves. I've turned the computer on, and these assistants are placing a giant floppy disk, both out of cardboard, and it's put into the computer. And the floppy disk drive person wears it.、Uh, she finds the first sector on the disk and、uh, takes data off the disk and passes it off to, of course, the bus. So the bus diligently carries the data into the computer to the memory. To the CPU, the VRAM, etc., and it's an actual working computer.、Um, that's a bus, really, <laughs> and it looks kind of fast. That's a mouse driver, where it's X Y. It looks like it's happening kind of quickly, but it's actually a very slow computer. And when I realized how slow this computer was compared to how fast the computer is, it made me wonder about computers and technology in general.、Um, and so I'm going to talk today about four things, really. The first three things are、uh, about How I've been curious about technology, design, and art, and how they intersect, how they overlap, and also a topic that I've taken on since four years ago. I became the president of Rhode Island School of Design leadership, and I'll talk about how I've looked to combine these four areas in、uh, a kind of a synthesis, a kind of experiment. So,、uh, starting from technology, technology is a wonderful thing.、Um, when that Apple II came out, it really could do nothing. It could show text, and after we waited a bit, we had these things called images. Remember when images were first possible with a computer? It was gorgeous, full-color images. And then after a few years, we got CD-quality sound. It was incredible. You could listen to sound on the computer. And then movies via CD-ROM. It was amazing. Remember that excitement? And then the browser appeared. The browser was great, but the browser was very primitive, very narrow bandwidth. Text first, then images. We waited. CD quality sound over the net, then movies over the internet. Kind of incredible. And then the mobile phone occurred. Text, images, audio, video, and now we have iPhone, iPad, Android with text, video, audio. <laughs> so, so, do you see the little pattern here?、Uh, we're kind of stuck in a loop, perhaps. And、uh, this sense of possibility from computing. Is something I've been questioning for the last ten、uh, or so years, and have looked to design as we understand most things. And to understand design without technology has been a passion of mine. And I have a small experiment to give you a quick design lesson.、Um, 
Designers talk about the relationship between form and content. Content and form. What does that mean? Well, content is the word up there. Fear. It's a four-letter word. It's a kind of a bad-feeling word. Fear. Fear is set in light Helvetica, so it's not too stressful. And, and if you set it in ultra-light Helvetica, it's like, oh, fear. Who cares? <laughs> right? You take the same ultra-light Helvetica, make it bigger, like, whoa, that hurts. Fear. So you can see how you change the scale, you change the form. Content is the same, but you, you feel differently. You change the typeface to like this typeface, and it's kind of funny. It's like pirate typeface, like Captain Jack Sparrow type. Like, ah, fear. Like, oh, that's not fearful. It's like really funny. Or fear like this, the, a kind of a nightclub typeface. Like we got to go to fear. <laughs> it's like amazing, right? It just changes. Same content. Or you make it, the letters are spread apart, they're huddled together like on the deck of the Titanic, and you feel sorry for the letters. Like, I feel the fear. You feel for them. Or you change the typeface to something like this. It's very classy. It's like that that expensive restaurant fear. I can never get in there. <laughs> It's just amazing fear. But that's form content. If you just change one letter in that content, you get a much better word, much better content. Free. Free is a great word. You can serve it almost any way. Free bold feels like Mandela free. It's like yes, I can be free. Free even light feels kind of like ah,、oh, I can breathe in free. It feels great. Or even free spread out. It's like ah,、oh, I can breathe in free so easily. And I can add in a blue gradient and、uh, a dove, and I have like Don Draper free. So. <laughs> You see that form, content, design works that way. It's a powerful thing. It's like magic almost, like the magicians we've seen at、uh, TED.、Um, it's magic. Design does that. And I've been curious about how design and technology intersect. And I want to show you some old work I never really show anymore to give you a sense of what I used to do.、Um, so, yeah.、Um, so I made a lot of work in the 90s.、Um, this was a square that responds to sound. People ask me why I made that. It's not clear, but <laughs> I I thought it'd be neat for the square to respond to me.、Um, and my kids were small then, and my kids would play with these things like ah, you know, they would say daddy ah ah you know, like that. We go to the computer store and they do the same thing. And they would say daddy, why does the computer respond to sound? And it was really at the time I was wondering why doesn't the computer respond to sound. So I made this as a kind of a experiment at the time. And then、um, I spent a lot of time in the space of interactive graphics and things like this. And I I stopped doing it because my students at MIT got so much better than myself. So I had to hang up my mouse. But in '96 I made my last piece. It was in black and white, monochrome, fully monochrome, all in integer mathematics. It's called Tap Typewrite. It's、uh, paying a tribute to the wonderful typewriter that my mother used to、uh, type on all the time as a legal secretary. It has ten variations. Is a shift. This is ten variations. This is like a spin the spin the letter around. This is like a, a ring of letters. This is twenty years old, so it's kind of a. Let's see, this is.、Um, I love the French film The Red Balloon. A great movie, right? I love that movie. So this is sort of like a, a play on that. Peaceful, like that.、Um, I'll show this last one. This is about balance. You know, it's it kind of stressful typing out. So if you type on this keyboard, you can like balance it out. If you hit G, life's okay. So I always say hit G, and it's going to be all right. Thank you.、Oh, thank you. So that was 20 years ago. And、um, I、uh, was always on the periphery of art.、Um, by being president of RISD, I've gone deep into art. And art is a wonderful thing. Fine art, pure art.、Um, you know, when people say I don't get art, I don't get it all. That means art is working. You know, it's like art is supposed to be enigmatic. So when you say like I don't get it, like oh that's great.、Um, <laughs> art does that because art is about asking questions. The questions that may not be answerable. 
Uh, at RISD, we have this amazing facility called the Edna Lawrence Nature Lab. It has 80,000 samples of animal, uh, bone, uh, mineral, plants. Um, you know, in Rhode Island, if an animal gets hit on the road, they call us up and we pick it up and stuff it. And why do we have this facility? Because at RISD, you have to look at the actual animal, the object, to understand its volume, to perceive it. At RISD, you're not allowed to draw from an image. And many people ask me, John, couldn't you just digitize all this, make it all digital? Wouldn't it be better? And I often say, well, um, there's something good to how things used to be done. There's something very different about it, something we should figure out what is good about how we did it, even in this new era. And I have a good friend, he's a new media artist named Tota Hasegawa. He's based in London, now actually he's in Tokyo, but when he was based in London, he had a game with his wife. Um, he would go to antique shops, and the game was as such. When we look at an antique we want, we'll ask the shopkeeper for the story behind the antique. And if it's a good story, we'll buy it. So they'd go to an antique shop, and they look at this cup, and they say, tell us about this cup. And the shopkeeper would say, it's old. <laughs> tell us more. Oh, it's really old. <laughs> and you saw over and over the antique's value was all about it being old. And as a new media artist, he reflected and said, you know, I spent my whole career making new media art. People say, wow, your art, what is it? It's new media. And he realized it isn't about old or new. It's about something in between. It isn't about old, the dirt, new, the cloud. It's about what is good, a combination of the cloud and the dirt is where the action is at. You see it in all interesting art today, in all interesting businesses today. How we combine those two together to make good is very interesting. So art makes questions. And leadership is something that is asking a lot of questions. We aren't functioning so easily anymore. We aren't, we aren't a simple authoritarian regime anymore. Um, as an example of authoritarianism, uh, I was in Russia one time traveling in St. Petersburg at a national monument, and I saw this sign. Uh, it says, do not walk on the grass. And I thought, well, I mean, I speak English, and you're trying to single me out. That's not fair. <laughs> but I found a sign for Russian-speaking people. And it was the best sign ever to say no. It was like no swimming, no hiking, no anything. My favorite ones are uh, no plants. Why would you bring a plant to the National Monument? I'm not sure. Uh, and also no love. <laughs> so that is authoritarianism. <laughs> and what, what is that structurally? It's a hierarchy. We all know the hierarchy is how we run many systems today. But as we know, it's been disrupted. It is now a network instead of a perfect tree. It's a heterarchy instead of hierarchy. And that's kind of awkward. And so today, leaders are faced with how to lead differently, I believe. Uh, this is work I've done with my colleague Becky Vermont on, on creative leadership. What can we learn from artists and designers for how to lead? Because in many senses, a regular leader loves to avoid mistakes. Someone who's creative actually loves to learn from mistakes. A traditional leader is always wanting to be right, whereas a creative leader hopes to be right. And I think this frame is important today in this complex, ambiguous space, and artists and designers have a lot to teach us, I believe. And um, I had a show in London recently where my friends invited me to come to London for four days to sit in a sandbox. And I said, great. And so I sat in a sandbox for four days straight, six hours every day, six minute appointments with anyone in London. And that was really bad. But um, I would listen to people, hear their issues, draw on the sand, try to figure things out, and it was kind of hard to figure out what I was doing. You know, it's like it was one-on-one -on -one meetings, like four days. And it felt kind of like being president, actually. I was like, oh, this is my job, president. I do a lot of these meetings, you know? And by the end of the experience, I realized why I was doing this. It's because leaders, what we do is we connect improbable connections and hope something will happen. And in that room, I found so many connections between people across all of London. And so leadership, connecting people, is the great question today, whether you're in the hierarchy or the hierarchy. It's a wonderful design challenge. And one thing I've been doing is uh, doing some uh, research on systems that can combine technology and leadership with an art and design perspective. Let me show you a, something I haven't shown anywhere, actually. So what this is, is a kind of sketch, application sketch wrote in Python. Um, you know how there's like Photoshop? This is called PowerShop. 
And the way it works is,、uh, imagine an organization. You know, the CEO isn't ever at the top. The CEO is at the center of the organization. There may be different subdivisions in the organization, and you might want to look into different areas. For instance,、uh, green are areas doing well, red are areas doing poorly. You know, how do you, as a leader, scan, connect, make things happen? So, for instance, you might open up、uh, distribution here and find the different subdivisions in there, and know that you know someone in eco over here. And、um, these people here are in eco. The people you might engage with as CEO, people you might be going across the hierarchy. And part of the challenge of the CEO is to find connections across areas. And so you might look in R and D, and here you see one person who crosses the two areas of interest, and it's a person important to engage. Um, so you might want to, for instance, get up a heads up display on how you're interacting with them. How many coffees do you have?、Uh, how often are you、uh, calling them, emailing them? What is the tenor of their email? How is it working out? Leaders might be able to use these systems to better regulate how they work inside the hierarchy. You can also imagine、uh, using technology like from Luminoso, the guys in Cambridge who were looking at deep、uh, text analysis. What is the tenor of your communications? So these kind of systems, I believe, are important.、Uh, they're targeted social media systems around leaders, and I believe that this kind of perspective will only begin to grow as more leaders enter the space of art and design. Because art design lets you think like this, find different systems like this, and、uh, I've just begun thinking like this. So I'm glad to share that with you. So in closing, I want to thank all of you. For your attention, thanks very much. What does a machine know about itself? Can it know when it needs to be repaired, and when it doesn't? In industries like manufacturing and energy. They're using predictive analytics to detect signs of trouble, helping some companies save millions on maintenance because machines seek help before they're broken and don't when they're not. That's what I'm working on. I'm an IBMer. Let's build a smarter planet.